Hi, this is Kevin from the Mathsaurus, and in this video we're going to look at the first five questions from the paper two of the Tamua from 2019, the test of mathematics for university admissions. Now paper two is the mathematical reasoning paper, and so this one focuses on your ability to deal with mathematical reasoning and also some simple ideas from uh, elementary logic. So it's a bit different in style to uh, to paper one, um, and we'll see that as we go through. If you want to do some extra sort of prep around this, or if you just enjoy the ideas of uh, mathematical logic, I would recommend two books. Um, the first one is this one, uh, Logic by uh, Wilfred Hodges. It's a quite readable book, and it's actually um, you know a lot about logic in sort of ordinary grammar and sentences and things like that, but also introduces some mathematical notation. I mean, it does more than you need for the Tamua, um, but a very interesting book. And the other one, if you're interested in something a bit more uh, you know, seriously mathematical is the great book by Imre Lektos, The Proofs and Refutations, which is written as a dialogue sort of between teacher and students um, talking about the nature of proofs and uh, how you construct mathematical proofs and what goes wrong in proofs, you know, when you can have statements that are true um, but a proof that's wrong for them and counterexamples and all of these sorts of things in great detail. That's quite a challenging book to read but it would be an absolutely fantastic uh, one as preparation and a great personal statement book as well. I'm going to put links to both of those in the description below. Nobody's sponsoring me to say this but I do make a few pence if you buy it through my Amazon store um, uh, underneath here. The thing I'd really love you to do though is to like the video and subscribe to the channel because that really helps me get this content out there and encourages me to make a lot more. Um, I'm going to put the rest of this uh, paper into a playlist so it'll be four parts in total, five questions for each part uh, and I'll put it in the same playlist as uh, the paper one from 2019 that I've already uh, gone through. So I hope this is useful to you, good luck if you're taking this paper and let me get on with the questions. So in this question we want to find the coefficient of the x to the 4 term uh, in this expansion here and you can see that there's an x squared on the outside and then you know we could do a full binomial expansion of uh, this something to the power of 6 um, but really we just want to try and isolate this particular term so if it's going to be x to the 4 overall I want an x squared term from the uh, 2x plus 1 over x to the 6 and then that will multiply by the x squared. So if you think about it, the right term to take here is the one that's 2x to the power of 4 times 1 over x uh, squared. All right, and you can just try different possibilities until you find the right one. Um, just remembering these do have to add up to 6. Uh, and then what the coefficient that will go with that would be uh, 6 choose 2 or 6 choose 4. So we've just got to work that out. Uh, so 6 choose 2, um, you can do in a number of ways. You could write out Pascal's triangle if you want, I'll just use the formula. 6 factorial over <clears throat> 4 factorial, 2 factorial. Now 6 factorial over 4 factorial is just 6 times 5, so this is 6 times 5 over 2, which is 15. So I want to have 15, and then I'm going to get also a 2 to the power of 4 from the 2x to the power of 4. So it's 15 times 16, which is 240. And so the answer is E. In question two, um, it says 2x plus 1 and 2x minus 1 are factors of this expression. If you see uh, something factors of a polynomial, one of the things that we should immediately think about is the factor theorem. Um, so for x minus 2, that means if I substitute in x equals 2 uh, into this expression, we get 0, right? That's the factor theorem. So if I do 2 times 2 cubed plus p times 2 squared, plus q, I must get 0, so that's 16 plus 4p plus q equals 0. And then for 2x plus 1, so the slightly more advanced case of the factor theorem, you know, um, again, it's whatever value of x makes that bracket 0 must also make the overall expression 0. Right? If you think about it, it's just because you know I can write this as 2x plus 1 times something else, so the value of x here that makes this bracket 0, which is x equals minus a half, when I substitute it into the whole expression, it would be 0 times whatever else I have here, so also 0. Okay, So uh, if we put that in here, we get 2 times minus 1 half cubed plus p times minus 1 half squared plus q, and that's going to be 0 as well. So if we simplify this, this is minus an eighth times 2, so that's minus a quarter, and this is plus 1 quarter p plus q equals 0. So it makes sense to multiply that by 4 and get minus 1 plus p plus 4q equals 0. So I've got these two simultaneous 
equations now uh, for P and Q, so I can just solve those to find uh, P and Q. Uh, so the first one is 4P plus Q equals minus 16, and the second one is P plus 4Q equals uh, 1. So let's multiply the second one by 4 here and get 4P plus 16Q equals 4, and then subtract the first one from the second one. Um, and that's going to give us 15q equals 4 minus minus 16, which is 20. So q equals 20 over 15, or 4 over 3. Um, and then I can just go back here and say, well, that means p is 1 minus 4q, right? So that's 1 minus 4 times 4 thirds. So that's 3 minus 16 over 3, which is minus 13 over 3. And then finally, we can put it all together and say, okay, that means that 2p plus q, that's minus 26 plus 4 over 3, which is minus 22 over 3. So a little bit of algebra uh, there. Perhaps you can find a faster route to get to 2p plus q directly or something. Um, but that's uh, not going to take you too long in the test. You should be fast at these sorts of methods. But do put in the comments if, you've, um, if you can see a nice, easy, fast way to get to 2p plus q here without, without uh, working out p and q first. Perhaps that's possible. Right, in three it says a, b, and c are real numbers. Given that a times b equals a times c, which of the following statements must be true? Um, and, well, okay, does a have to be zero? Well, no, not necessarily, because you could have both b and c equal to zero, then you'd have zero equals zero, right? So that one, so here I don't have to think too much about all the possible different cases, I've just got to find a way of, of breaking it here. So one doesn't have to be true. Does b or c have to be zero? Well, no, because you could have a equals zero, and then doesn't matter what B and C are, this would work. Um, and does B have to be C? Uh, well, um, uh, again, no, I mean, you know, if A is, a is zero, then uh, that doesn't work either. Right, so none of them have to be true, and the answer is A, and we can just move on quickly. In question four, it says, consider the following conjecture. If N is a positive integer that consists of the digit at one followed by an odd number of zero digits and then a final digit one, then n is a prime number. They've given us three numbers here and we want to know which of them provide a counterexample to the conjecture. Now, to be a counterexample for the conjecture, it has to be uh, an, an example that shows that the conjecture is false. So it must satisfy all of the premises for the conjecture, all of the conditions for the conjecture, but it mustn't satisfy the, uh, the, the final statement, the, the, the outcome of the conjecture, if you like, right? So um, so to be a counterexample, the number n would have to be a positive integer consisting of the digit one followed by an odd number of zero digits, right? So, uh, so that automatically rules out number two because one zero zero one has an even number of zero digits in the middle. So it can't be a counterexample. So 101 and 10,001 could in theory be counterexamples. They both satisfy the premise here, one zero one has an odd number of zeros, and this one has an odd number of zeros as well. Um, but then it also has to satisfy the conclusion, that's the word I was looking for earlier, the conclusion of the statement, which is that n is a prime number. And uh, well, one in one, 101 is a prime number, so it's not a counterexample. It actually verifies the statement. Okay, it doesn't prove it, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's a correct, you know, but it doesn't provide a counterexample, right? But three, does provide a counterexample because it satisfies the premises, but does not satisfy the conclusion because it's not a prime number. So it's only uh, three that can be a counterexample here, and the answer is D. Question five says, consider this statement about the positive integers a, b, and n. Uh, a, b is divisible by n, and we want to say uh, the condition either a or b is divisible by n. Now, is it necessary or sufficient, both or neither? Um, okay, so, um, so a condition a, Right, is sufficient for B if A implies B. Right, so here A is sufficient for B. So what that means is that if A is true, that's enough to make B true. Right, that's where that language comes from. Right, um, and if A is necessary for B, that means the other way around that B implies A. Right, so that means that whenever B is true, A necessarily has to be true. Okay, so we've got to think about this statement. Right, so if either A or B is divisible by N, 
does that mean that a times b is divisible by n? Well, well, yes, it does, doesn't it? Right, because you know if uh, you know if, if if a is divisible by n, then a times b must also be divisible by n, and or if b is divisible by n, then a times b would also just automatically be divisible by n, right? We know that, right? If I take a number like 15 that's got 3 as a factor and I multiply it by 100, then 1500 is also going to have 3 as a factor, right? Pretty clear cut. I don't think I have to say anything more about that. Um, so that means that this condition, right, when this condition is true, then it implies the condition star, right? So that means it's sufficient uh, for b. Now, is it necessary? So is it the case that when a times b is divisible by n, that 1 of a or b has to be divisible by n? And, you know, there are tons of examples here that show this isn't true. Um, you know, you can pick all sorts of ones here. I don't know why I went for 3 times 5 squared times 7, right? And I said, uh, now, if we think of, if we thought of a as 3 times 5 and b as 5 times 7, right, and this is a times b, then the number 25, right, well, a times b is divisible by 25, because so it's got a factor of 5 squared, but neither a nor b are divisible by 25. Right, so, uh, so, so that means that we've got uh, sufficiency, but it's not, this is not necessary for this to be true. There are cases where a times b is divisible by n, but this is not true, so it's not necessary. So the answer is sufficient, but not necessary. By the way, there are simpler examples, uh, smaller numbers here that you could choose um, to, to prove that, to, to show this um, fact that it's not necessary here. But uh, that is all we need. So I hope that was useful. Please do like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and click the bell notifications if you want to get notifications for when I put the rest of these uh, videos out. I'm trying to finish the Tamua 2019 in time for the 2020 paper, but there'll be lots more content coming in the future as well.